afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the last of our this year's in the CMC's uh, Media and Democracy Lecture Series. I'm Jeff Smith. I work here at the theater and with the Media Center, and particularly with the uh, Institute for Information and Democracy, also known as GRID. Um, just a couple announcements for our, before I bring our speaker up. Um, I'm going to pass around for folks who aren't already on the mailing if they're interested in getting information about upcoming events. Uh, just for folks who maybe saw it or didn't get a chance to see the Walmart documentary the other night, which we had about 360 people at, which was fabulous. We're going to run it again on Wednesday, November 30th at 7 o'clock. Um, this information should be on the website in a couple days for that, but just let folks who didn't get a chance to see it if they want to, we're going to show it again on the 30th. Um, also, as a as sort of a way of sort of supporting the work that, that GRID does in particular, we have a, an annual sort of a fundraiser called the Newsies, which is kind of a, our version of the Daily Show, if you will. We, not that it's hard to make fun of local broadcast news, but that's kind of what we do, and uh, we don't make the stuff up because they, they do it all by themselves. But that's on uh, Wednesday, the 7th of December, also here at 7 o'clock. Uh, if people need to use the bathrooms throughout the day, we're out to the left and to the left again, so it's always to the left. And um, we're going to, after uh, Bob speaks, we're going to, he's going to show part of a documentary that he has that looks specifically at what happened in Ohio in 2004. Uh, and then we're going to hear from Kim Spring, who's with uh, local efforts on election reform. And if you have a chance, one thing we'd really love for you to do before you leave today, whether it's after the lecture or after the This Divided State film, is to fill out a very small, take you no more than a minute evaluation, because we're trying to get more folks interested in local election reform issues here in Greater Grand Rapids area. As I said, this is the third in the uh, Meeting Democracy Lecture Series, and um, we've been putting these to DVD, and by early December, you'll be able to get all three on one DVD if you're interested, you know, for those stocking stuffers, all that sort of um, holiday cheer kind of thing. I, uh, I met Bob about a year and a half ago in Ohio. I was down there for a media conference in Columbus, and uh, him and his wife hosted us at their house, both Tom and I, uh, and had a great time. And um, of course, you know, been sort of reading his stuff and looking at his website on a regular basis. He also has a little history here because he used to go to William James, the old um, Grand Valley State uh, College, you know, when it, was, when it was a college, not before it was a university. Um, and so certainly has that connection and could tell stories about how, again, the uh, Amway folks uh, did whatever they could to sort of get rid of that sort of left radical element of uh, education in the community. But he's here to speak about specifically what happened in Ohio in 2004 and what's been happening since then in particular, um, because this is an ongoing battle, not only there, but across the country. Um, he's been uh, involved in independent media production for years and years, doing video, uh, uh, producing a, a newspaper a website, freepress.org. Um, he's been an election observer both in the U.S. and abroad, and um, uh, he has a very interesting take on what's been happening, and I think um, in some ways probably a bit shocking for, for many of us uh, in terms of, of what actually happened and, and what we need to think about for the future. So without any further ado, I'd like to give a warm welcome to Bob Fitrekas. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, I haven't been back in Grand Rapids much uh, since my college days. I uh, got a PhD down at Wayne State, and unfortunately, I got a JD from The Ohio State University when I was hanging out in Columbus. Uh, but as part of that process, uh, uh, I must admit that a lot of the stuff, my political activity, uh, really began at uh, Columbus, I mean at uh, Grand Valley State Colleges back when it was that cluster uh, of very progressive and open colleges. And uh, of course I lived in this city for five years. And uh, 
My move to Ohio uh, made me, of course, appreciate Michigan in many ways. Uh, not that uh, Columbus isn't a fine city and people are very nice and, uh, and friendly. Uh, but I've been teaching political science down there for uh, 19 years now uh, at Columbus State, the feeder school to Ohio State. But with that in mind, uh, let me just sort of give you a feel for uh, my involvement in the election uh, debacle uh, that became known as Ohio, which led, of course, as some of you recall, to the first ever challenge to a complete uh, slate of electoral uh, uh, voters in the history of this country. That is, the entire uh, electoral college delegation of Ohio was challenged. That's the first time that an entire uh, electoral college delegation from a state has ever happened, uh, ever been challenged in the history of this country. Uh, what we need to realize, uh, looking at this as a political scientist uh, and as someone who has written tracking polls and studied U.S. history, is that what happened in Ohio was very well thought out. Uh, a lot of this, it was no accident and uh, it shouldn't be a surprise that much of it uh, can be linked eventually to Karl Rove uh, in the White House, uh, direct ties there, uh, as well as to a man named J. Kenneth Blackwell, who's the, officially the Secretary of State uh, in Ohio, but he was also the co-chair of the Bush-Cheney Committee. Uh, since we have the Michigan-Ohio State game uh, today, uh, let's begin with the obvious analogy. Uh, if when uh, Michigan, say, is playing at Ohio State uh, and you witness the game and you realize that the head referee is dressed in scarlet and gray, he's the co-chair of the Booster Club, he is high-fiving uh, the Buckeyes after every taco and every single call goes against the Wolverines uh, and for the other side, uh, none of us would say that that is fair. But of course, that is the role that J. Kenneth Blackwell played uh, in the 2004 election. Uh, he called it a model election, but I think it was a model election uh, if you were in a third world banana republic uh, that liked to suppress votes and uh, deprive people of votes. So I'm not exactly sure what it was a model for. And again, I speak here as the uh, International Election Observer who in 1994 in El Salvador co-wrote uh, and edited the report of the International Election Observers that was delivered to the United Nations. And I fall, uh, saw far worse suppression in Ohio, in Columbus, Ohio, than I did in 1994 when I was at ground zero of the conflictive zone between the guerrillas and the death squads is that the stuff that went on in Ohio simply would not have been tolerated uh, in El Salvador. Now, with that in mind, let, let's take a look at this. Uh, uh, let's begin with the obvious facts. Uh, only one president in history has been elected without winning Ohio. And that, of course, was John Kennedy, who put uh, Lyndon Johnson on his ticket and picked up Texas that year. No Republican president has ever won the presidency without winning in Ohio. After the year uh, 2000, it was very clear that Ohio was key to winning the election. So what began to happen are a variety of things. Beginning in 2001, and I say this as a practicing attorney in Ohio, so I hope the Ohio Supreme Court doesn't get too upset. Uh, but this is fact. $14 million of illegal money came into the state of Ohio anonymously from the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, taking a f Supreme Court that was four to three Republican with the, a swing vote who was a moderate Republican, Andy Douglas. Four years later, after 14 million illegal corporate anonymous dollars came into that state. The Ohio Supreme Court, which would hear any challenge to the 2004 election by law, 
was six Republican, one Democrat, with five of them hardcore conservatives. In fact, just this past week, they were found guilty, the Chamber of Commerce, for illegal money coming into the state of Ohio, and they were fined $1,000, the maximum penalty from the Ohio Election Commission. So you've got massive illegal money coming in. Some of you may be familiar with CoinGate as well. At the same time, uh, a illegal slush fund was set up in Ohio, $50 million secretly being invested from the Ohio Bureau of Workmen's Compensation. A man named Tom Noe, uh, who was also the chair of the Lucas County Board of Election. Uh, in, that's where Toledo is. His wife was the chair during the election. Uh, and there was numerous problems there we'll get to later. But Mr. Noe, uh, having gotten this $15 million, and he was highly qualified, he was a nearly bankrupt hobby shop owner who sold BB, Beanie Babies, baseball cards, and a few rare coins. So because of his expertise, they put him in charge of $15 million secretly, which of course he celebrated by giving himself about $1.34 million, uh, which he wasn't entitled to for getting the contract. He then uh, took about $14 million in administrative fees. And shockingly, this money found its way into the campaign of George W. Bush, Ken Blackwell, and Bob Taft. Systematic, deliberate money laundering from the Bureau of Worker, Workmen's Comp. Uh, Noe has now been un, indicted. Uh, the governor of Ohio, Bob Taft, a very good friend of the Bush family, uh, has become the first governor in the history of Ohio uh, to be indicted in office. Uh, three misdemeanor, uh, first degree misdemeanor violations, which he had to apologize for, 62 times he met with major donors, including Mr. Noe, who said he discussed the secret slush fund, which the governor denies. But he did not deny, because it was in the record, that he met at least 62 times with these major donors, which include Walden O'Dell, the CEO of Diebold Corporation of North Canton, who lives in a manor, uh, it's Coswell Manor, in Upper Arlington, the most affluent community in Central Ohio. Mr. O'Dell, you recall, in 2003 sent out a letter under his stationery, under his signature as CEO of Diebold, promising to deliver Ohio's electoral votes to George W. Bush. This is after being at the Crawford Ranch and being part of the president's Ranger uh, team, Ranger and Pioneer team. So as we begin to think about it, not only that, his software is used in over half the 88 counties in Ohio. GEMS, General Election Management uh, Software. The General Election Management System software is notoriously inaccurate and most famous for, among other things, having a tendency to flip votes. So with that in mind, as we're working up to the election day, you've got massive problems throughout the state of Ohio. First of all, you've got the systematic disenfranchisement uh, of voters. In Cincinnati, between 2001 and 2004, 105,000 voters, primarily in the inner city, were purged from uh, active voting list because there is a law in Ohio which says even if you had voted in a local election, if you hadn't voted in the last two federal elections, 2000 and 2002, you could be purged. 105,000 voters purged in Cincinnati alone. In Lucas County, where Tom Noe's wife was in charge as the chair of the Lucas County Board of Elections, 28,000 people purged in August, according to the Toledo Blade. One couple had voted for 44 straight years at the same address from the 1960 election, 
of Kennedy and Nixon. They called down and asked if they were voters. They were assured that their name was on the voting rolls. They were purged in late August, showed up on election day, were no longer voters. Overall, from Cleveland to Toledo to Cincinnati, overwhelmingly in the urban areas, over 300,000 people lost their right to vote. And that doesn't count the fact that J. Kenneth Blackwell made two interesting decisions in the run-up to the election. He discovered an obscure law in Ohio that unless you have registered on 80 bond unwaxed white paper, cardboard stock, a law from before digital scanning, uh, since most boards of election were using 20 bond paperweight, the standard paper nowadays and scanning things in, he, was, he directed the Board of Elections to send back people's registrations, to not to treat them as a registration, but as an inquiry to register. Throughout the uh, decades in Ohio, if you showed up at the polling place uh, and you were registered in the county, you had moved, or you were simply at the wrong table, you could vote and your vote would count at the national, state, and county level. It just wouldn't count for local issues if there was uh, a repeal of some local ordinance or you were trying to make a uh, local district or precinct wet or dry. Mr. Blackwell reinterpreted the law. He said that if you were at the right polling place but the wrong table, is that your vote would not be counted for president. Now, in Toledo alone, over 5,000 people who would have been eligible to vote in the spring uh, in the presidential primary and by decades prior lost their right to vote. 2,000 people in Columbus who would have been allowed to vote, their votes weren't counted. In Columbus, Ohio, people waited up to seven hours in line in the inner city, three, four, five, six, seven hours. I had a stopwatch, I was timing these things. And if you were at the wrong table, J. Kenneth Blackwell instructed that you would be sent to another table or forced to vote provisionally and then your vote would not be counted. This was systematic voter suppression. This was well thought out voter suppression. If we in Ohio, we're a southern state, although we appeared to act like it in the last election. We would have been under the Voting Rights Act of 1965. Under the Voting Rights Act of 1965, you can't change precincts at the last second. J. Kenneth Blackwell systematically shut down precincts all over the Ohio inner cities. I, in the 1990s, used to vote uh, about a half a block to the west of where I live in Ward 55B. They shut that precinct down, opened a new one a quarter of a block to the east. I was not assigned there. I was assigned more than half a mile away to a different facility. Uh, this is what we call not neighborhood polling places, but the polling place to which J. Kenneth Blackwell has arbitrarily assigned you. And then on his own website, the Secretary of State forgot to update, and it was six months old, which precinct you were supposed to vote in. And then suddenly the mighty Texas strike force comes in, formed by Karl Rove out of the White House, and they begin to direct people to the logical voting place, creating massive chaos throughout the inner cities of Columbus on election day. Now add to that the fact that in Franklin County, where the person who drew up this plan, the Franklin County Board of Elections Director, Matthew Damschroeder, is the former chair of the Franklin County Republican Party, is that they needed 5,000 voting machines to conduct an election. They conducted the election with 2,886 machines, of which they forgot to put out 125 machines. 
all 125 they forgot to put out were in the inner city, were in the democratic city of Columbus, where every elected official from the mayor and city council are all Democrats. 74% of the African American wards, 42 wards had fewer voting machines in the general election than they had in the primary. 1,200 people to vote, two machines. 77 of the machines broke overwhelmingly in the inner city. We're arguing that this is not chance. This is a deliberate attempt to create high-tech Jim Crow conditions in the inner city by making people reliant on voting machines and then not supplying those voting machines. We now have the Board of Election in Mahoning County admitting that with their direct uh, recording electronic or e-voting computer voting machines, 18 of them were vote hopping because of incorrect settings. That is, in 18 precincts, people who push the button for John Kerry, it hopped to George W. Bush. In Franklin County, those who push for John Kerry, the vote faded away. Now, what often people will say, and I speak here as someone who is not a Democrat, I'm an independent, and in fact, uh, uh, I disagree with the mayor and the Democratic council in the city, and I ran as an independent uh, with the green support. I was there primarily as a lawyer because of my background in election observation. In fact, in many cases, the Democratic Party has officially done little to, exact, uh, to challenge the obvious voter suppression that occurred. Uh, it's almost as if they think if they behave, that this type of behavior will go away. It won't. It's only going to get worse. What we saw in uh, the rest of Ohio was equally troubling. Let me hit some of the highlights, uh, which, of course, uh, are in my book. Uh, and part of what we did uh, was we knew we would be attacked if we brought these uh, incidences forward. So we put people under oath. We took sworn affidavits. To this day, much of the mainstream media will say what we had was anecdotal evidence. That is a code word for the largest systematic under oath sworn hearings and statements in the history of Ohio. That is, we hired court reporters. We swore people in. We took their statements. It's evidence in legal procedures and has been admitted in court cases. It's not anecdotal evidence. It's the largest systematic collection of affidavits and testimony ever taken on voting irregularities in the United States. And let me tell you some of the other things we found out. In Warren County, Ohio, apparently Osama bin Laden was in the region because the County Board of Election called a level 10 Homeland Security alert on their own, the highest level. They then excluded the media. You can read these accounts in mainstream media stories in the Cincinnati Inquirer. They excluded the media. And not only that, because of the Homeland Security alert, they had to divert the ballots to an unauthorized warehouse under the control of a well-known Republican supervisor where they held the ballots safely from Osama bin Laden till in the wee hours of the morning, Bush got a surprising 14,000 vote increase in Warren County. In Miami County, and here I must beg to differ with Mother Jones, which wrote a horrendous, I think a horrendous review of my book and Mark Crispin Miller's book. They didn't actually refer to the book. Uh, Mark, uh, the guy who did that, Mark Hertzgard, called up uh, a individual in Miami County, and that was his investigative reporting. Here is what happened in Miami County. In Miami County, at a little after 9 o'clock, 100% of the vote was in. Uh, at 1.43 in the morning, we were PDFing the screens from the 88 counties. We had peoples on computers watching these screens and freezing them, saving them. Uh, 
what happened at 143, 19,000 more votes came in. And what was odd about it is the vote for Kerry was at the exact same percentage, 32.92% as it had been prior to the 19,000 votes. It's as if somebody had pushed a button on a computer and just added another 7,000 votes uh, to the president by adding 19,000 more votes. In Butler County, uh, Bush won Ohio by 118,000 votes. On election night, when Kerry conceded, he was losing by 137,000 votes. Going back and merely cleaning up the mistakes caused Kerry to gain nearly 20,000 votes. There was more than 19,000 votes that were mistakenly given to the president. You may have recalled Gehanna Ward 1B. That is the notorious fish and loaves precinct uh, at the New Light Church is that 638 people cast votes in that precinct, and lo and behold, it was delivered unto George W. Bush, 4,292 votes. The, uh, that was caught. In fact, uh, I worked with the nonpartisan group that caught that. Uh, and this was very difficult. Uh, it, it invoked my kindergarten level math. That is, if 638 people voted, how did the president get 4,000 258 votes. Uh, but we were assured by those folks at the New Life Church, those followers of Jerry Falwell, that nobody uh, at that church would have dared hacked into that computer, which would have been easily done. Uh, we actually consulted a Republican computer expert who showed us how to do it. So 4,258 votes. Uh, they double counted Bush's votes in Sandusky, a Republican area, uh, for absentee ballots. Uh, and then, of course, there was the miracle of Perry County, where uh, people loved uh, the president so much. Uh, in one area, they turned out at 124% of the registered voters, and in another precinct, 120%. When we pointed these out, they decertified them, recertified them, and then called us conspiracy theorists. So that's the game that is played. They'll say, well, that wasn't enough in and of itself to swing the election. But this is what we point out. 7,000 people lost their vote in Lucas County in the inner city because the Debolt OptiScan machines froze up. We now know from public records requests that they were freezing up prior to the election. And mysteriously, they were only freezing up in the inner city. Also, somebody accidentally put out the wrong OptiScan markers. Again, in the inner city wards only. Thus, causing to this day 93,000 uncounted machine rejected votes in wards that voted 70 to 30 for Kerry. That is 93,000 votes remain uncounted overwhelmingly in Cleveland and in Toledo. So there you're picking up 30,000 votes for Kerry. 7,000 in Toledo. The Washington Post has suggested as many as 22,000 votes, that's a conservative estimate, were lost in Columbus because of the 77 broken machines and the 125 machines they forgot to put out at the start of the election. Uh, others calculate that as high as 60,000. Despite record registration in the inner city, estimated to be close to 100%. There was only a little over 1% increase in the amount of voters in the inner city of Franklin County in Columbus. In Butler County, let's go to Butler County. What do we find? They want us to believe in Butler County that the president received 106,000 votes. And then right down the ticket, the Republican Supreme Court justice got 68,000. And right under him, a African-American retired municipal judge who was pro-gay rights got 63,000 votes. And John Kerry, who had 1,000 volunteers in three headquarters in the county, got 54,000 votes. Is that this is done on central tabulators with secret software. 
either from Diebold or ESNS, which has strong Republican ties. Two brothers, the Urasevich brothers, dating back to the 1980s, two brothers have developed all of this software. Part of it originally is part of benign projects in the third world to make sure election results were correct from a US foreign policy perspective. Let's think about what is happening, not only in Ohio on election day, but subsequent to election day. I'll talk a little about the recount, but let me talk about a variety uh, of other things that should give us cause for concern. As we look at these voting machines, we know they have massive flaws. We now know that the General Accountability Office, uh, at least has told us, that you can mess with the definition. In all Glaze County, two weeks before the election, an unauthorized ES and S worker was caught on the ballot making machine and the central tabulator. You can simply, with e-voting, computer voting, with software, preset your results. The General Accountability Office, again, just issued a report that has virtually remained uh, uncovered in the mainstream media. Everything we've been saying about these machines has now been confirmed as easily doable in terms of being hacked. Uh, from remote access in at least two counties, from central tabulators. And in fact, when I briefed John Kerry following the election, his one comment back to me was this. I said, look, something is wrong with these numbers. You know, people are going to bed at midnight with you winning 5147, and they wake up in the morning and the numbers are flipped. And oddly, the exit polls don't match but the exit polls are outside the margin of error, but they're only outside the margin of error in the swing states, in the key swing states. And all of them uh, are for Bush. It's not random. It defies it. If 10 states are wrong, 10 of the 11 swing states, but they're all wrong against Kerry, is that really wrong? Statistically, it says something else is at work. That is the corruption of the vote itself. But nobody wants to consider that in the United States. We've been socialized to believe that no one would do that here. We've been, you know, we're believing our own bullshit uh, in terms of enculturation instead of the obvious facts. Look, in the 1990s, we were out of the 50 major democracies, we were 49th out of 50. Yeah, sure, we beat the hell out of Botswana. It's something to be proud of in terms of voter turnout. In the 80s, we were 44th. Yet we go around thinking we can shock in all other countries into democracy. Why not start here with getting our own democracy right? 3% of the people that cast vote in the Ohio election, their votes were never counted. So they can come out and tell an exit poll, yeah, I voted for John Kerry. But if the votes are not being recorded, if private partisan corporations, major donors to the president are responsible for those companies and their technicians are handling all those votes, we should be afraid. The poll workers don't know what's running in those black boxes, in those e-voting machines. The county people have no idea these private companies have become the arbiters of our democracy. They'll tell you there's a receipt. There's not a real receipt. It's garbage in, garbage out. Yes, the machine can tell you what uh, it was programmed into it, but if there was a real ballot, if in reality, when you push that machine under plexiglass, you could see that your vote was recorded for Bush or Kerry or Cobb, or any candidate you, you voted for, then it was cut and put into a lockbox with a scanner, then you'd have a voter verified paper ballot. What we have now is push and pray, faith-based voting. 
And we can't have that in a democracy. It is absolutely unacceptable. Also, it's unacceptable when following the election, when a recount was asked for, is that it was done non-randomly. Under Ohio law, you're supposed to randomly, randomly pick 3% of the precincts and recount them. J. Kenneth Blackwell, co-chair of Bush Cheney Re-election Committee, came up with a new definition of random. I'm a political scientist. Random means every precinct, all 3%, have equal chance of being selected. It's just like the lottery. All the balls have an equal chance of popping up. Blackwell decided that random could mean pre-selecting. And random could mean pre-selecting by the Republican firm Triad. Pre-selecting by the Republican firm Debolt. Pre-selecting by the Republican firm ES&S. They could come in and tell you which one's the count. Not that Triad, not that they're not helpful, they are. For example, they showed up on the day of the recount in Hocking County without even being scheduled and came in on their own without charging, removed the hard drive from the central tabulator and put in a new hard drive and told the workers not to turn the computer off. And if they wanted to match, get the exact right vote, here was a sheet of paper. You could read the sheet of paper and it would tell you what the vote and it matched perfectly the sheet of paper to the new hard drive. And when Cheryl Eaton, the deputy clerk uh, at the county board of elections, complained and swore out an affidavit, her approach was something seemed to be wrong here that somebody would show up who wasn't scheduled and change the hard drive out on the day the recount was taking place. And that's wrong. She was fired. Because they'll tell you, well, in Ohio, they couldn't have cheated. There was a bipartisan board of election. And I, let me tell you how bipartisan board of elections work. J. Kenneth Blackwell appoints everyone, and he fires everyone, and they get paid. So that's what they call bipartisan. Not only that, when the people in Hocking County, the Democratic Party, complained and said, look, the two Democrats have to step down. Cheryl Eaton's right. We shouldn't allow Triad to come in here and remove the hard drive when the recount is in process. The Democrats serving on the Board of Election said, we work for J. Kenneth Blackwell. We are not appointed by the Democratic Party. We serve at the pleasure of J. Kenneth Blackwell. And they actually went to the Attorney General's office and got a written statement saying that he appointed them and they will stay. What you find in many of these rural areas, because there isn't much of a Democratic Party outside of Cleveland and Akron and uh, Toledo, what you, for example, even in Franklin County where I am, the Democratic Party gets together and runs joint tickets with the Republican Party. And they also make agreements not to run candidates against each other. If you read the Columbus Dispatch, the Democrats agreed not to run two candidates for judges against Republican judges, and the Republicans agreed not to run anyone for sheriff and or county treasurer. And that's in a major urban area. In these rural counties, what you often find is that the wife of the leading Republican donor is the appointed Democrat on the board of elections is that so they'll turn around and say and even where you get a 2-2 split vote guess who gets to break every single vote J. Kenneth Blackwell so when they tell you that it couldn't have happened because of these bipartisan boards of election it could people on those board of elections have no idea call them up Call up your own people here, uh, whatever systems you're using in Michigan, and ask them, what software is running? How does it work? What you will find is stunning ignorance of epic proportion. And all you need on that election day is that technician's badge to come in that says Debolt or ES&S and Triad. You can take hard drives out. 
you can remove machines, you can tamper and correct the software. What just happened in Ohio? The University of Akron predicted reform issues two and three would pass with 60% of the vote. The Columbus Dispatch, which has been so historically accurate, Republican newspaper, editorial policy, but famous for its polling, told us that issue two, that it allowed people to vote early by mail or in person. And issue three, that said you couldn't give $10,000 to an individual but only 2000 because the Republicans just passed election reform. Their election reform was to go from $2,000 per individual per election cycle to $10,000. Uh, these things were passing. 61% were showing approval to vote yes for issue three, 59% for issue two. We just had 41 counties add electronic voting machines from Diebold amidst the chaos, which you can read about in the Dayton Daily News and the Toledo Blade and numerous rural newspapers amidst 187 memory cards being lost to the wee hours of the morning in Dayton alone, amidst the lost memory cards in Toledo. What you end up finding is that the final results look like they've been flipped. How many people voted for issue two, which both the University of Akron and the Columbus Dispatch said would pass with 59, 60% of the vote, they're telling you it only got about 33% of the vote. What about issue three, 61% of the vote? They're telling you it got 32% of the vote. It's as if somebody hit a switch on a computer or programmed those memory cards to read the exact opposite. Now, whatever that programming is, they can spit it out of the computer but there is no ballot anywhere to show how every individual voter actually voted. There is no ballot to recount. So what I would suggest to you today is that what is at stake here with these brand shiny new e-voting machines and anyone who opposes them is considered to be a reactionary or anyone who dare say this is not done in any other democracy in the world People have a voter verified paper trail. Wherever those voices are raised, people are called conspiracy theorists. People are marginalized. But the vast majority of people know in this country that democracy is important. They heed the words of Abraham Lincoln at the battlefield of Gettysburg that what we fight for is simple. Government of the people, by the people, and for the people. And that it will in fact perish if we allow these private partisan corporations to secretly count our ballot. If we allow them to seize the people's vote. That's what's at stake here. It's something infinitely more important than whether Bush or Kerry won. It is the very core and soul of our nation. And we need to go forth in this battle and be determined that we will not be deterred by whatever they call us. We will demand an accountable democracy and we shall make sure that the battle will be waged and ultimately democracy will triumph. And I'll leave you with those thoughts and take some questions. If, if people have questions, just raise a hand. I'll come around so we can get it on, get the audio. So who's got questions? You're going to make me run over there, huh? I was a no, uh, native of Norwalk, Ohio, which was in uh, Huron County, and I heard that Huron was one of those that was uh, anyway. And that, uh, which county was that again? Huron. In in uh, Ohio, about uh, ten miles from 
Cedar Point. Oh, okay, yeah. Oh, yeah, the, uh, that, that whole area we found uh, uh, somewhat uh, curious is that there were some very odd vote totals that were coming out there, including even in the Supreme Court races. So uh, that, uh, some of those areas on the other side of, is it on the other side of uh, east of Cleveland? Uh, is it what uh, it's now under what is it under DRE Debolt Direct? Uh, are you talking in the 2005 election there? Yes. Uh, the last votes, yeah, we're uh, we're finding a direct correlation between all of those that appear to have used these new e-voting machines. Uh, that the poll numbers don't seem to make any sense. Uh, uh, oddly, in Wally O'Dell's Upper Arlington, you're getting better results than in many of those counties up in that area. Apparently a lot of people showed up and just said, no way do I want early easy voting. What I want to really do is stand in long lines on election day and change their mind at the last second. But yeah, we, we are finding uh, irregularities there as we are uh, throughout uh, most of Ohio. And it really doesn't make sense on issues two and three because every poll that was taken clearly showed that they were uh, in fact passing. I mean, who shows up and says, I'm against early voting? I mean, I, I don't know who it was, but uh, uh, I don't think these, I think these are cyber voters. I think these people were manufactured. I have a question. I was wondering how you can get your message in every newspaper and news show, and John Stewart. Oh, the, uh, I don't know. I think a lot of it's gonna depend on uh, people here uh, locally. Uh, you know, I've, I've done literally hundreds and hundreds of radio uh, reports. You know, I've testified before Congress. Uh, I'm going back to uh, uh, brief the Progressive Caucus. I'm going back to testify before the Judiciary Committee. Uh, you know, I've written two books. I think, uh, you know, the big breakthrough uh, is going to come when people at the local level, uh, we're going to have to battle them. Uh, and make sure, you know, I, I know the uh, Grand Rapids Press is here today and hopefully some of this will, uh, will get into that newspaper. Uh, in many ways, we've had better luck in, uh, uh, in some of the smaller cities and markets than we have uh, in the major cities. And I think a lot of this has to do with, uh, uh, with the fact that uh, John Kerry uh, didn't stand and fight or a guarantee that every vote was going to be counted. But I think, you know, uh, we're gonna have to use the internet. We're gonna have to use streaming video. We're gonna have to use a variety of ways to force them to cover this story. It's already a, a major story on the West Coast. Uh, I've had tremendous success out there. It seems to be a little tougher to convince people in the heartland here uh, that in the United States somebody would, uh, uh, you know, steal votes or steal elections or attempt to rig elections. But uh, I think if you look at most of, uh, of U.S. history is, uh, you know, there's always been attempts when, when such power is at stake. So uh, I would say that it's up to you in many ways. You know what you can do, write letters, write articles, research, go to your county board of election. I would begin by simply asking them what is in their machines, uh, particularly if they want to go to e-voting machines. Uh, because this will be one of the greatest mistakes of all time uh, if we have these machines and nobody knows what's running into them. It, it invites fraud. And the Debolt machines, I think the new machines are what I call one-stop fraud. They do everything from registered the voters to final tabulations. But we, we know when we looked at Perry County uh, in Ohio, they claimed that 10,000 people signed up on one day in 1977. The guy who installed that uh, system, who's a subcontractor, works for Debolt, who I've talked to extensively, but I can't reveal his name yet, because uh, he has a confidentiality agreement with that company. So, yeah, 10,000 people didn't sign up on one day in 1977. If you go to the main counties, you'll find even a major county like Franklin County, uh, you were only getting like four or 5,000 a month uh, during the 2004 election. Uh, but they just, a lot of this stuff, if people looked at it for more than a few minutes and thought about it, they would re realize that it was a massive fraud. And I think if we can get that message out. The key thing they got going, I, I just, a person just wrote me from a major state who's negotiating with Debolt, and she says, you know, I know what you're saying is true. Factually, the problem is with my colleagues. 
is that they're afraid of being called conspiracy theorists. So, I mean, what do you want to be, a coincidence theorist? It's like, okay, the universal law of exit polls work everywhere except in the United States and except in swing states. And what do you want to do, accept Matosky's explanation, which is one of the bizarrest explanations I've ever heard as a social scientist? He uses the reluctant voter thesis, which the reluctant voter thesis was like if you were voting communist in Waco, Texas in the 50s, you're afraid you're going to get beat up so you wouldn't disclose how you voted, right? Well, it, the new version of the theory is that Republican women in Republican counties only, in the late afternoon only, became reluctant to tell uh, exit pollsters how they voted. Uh, and why do you come up with a theory like that? Because you can't find them. Because, as we say in Ohio, the vote's never over till the cyber vote comes in. Because the women didn't exist, you got to pretend like they hid in the bathroom, you know, snuck out the side door, were hiding in the basement. Uh, it's, you know, it didn't happen. People are not reluctant in Republican counties by gender in the late afternoon only. It's, it's absurd, but that's the only thing they can come up with to explain this monumental exit poll error. Bob, I'm just going to, just as a point, since the question was about kind of what's happening here, I want to ask Kim Spring to get up a little bit and talk about what's happening locally, and then we'll take more questions directed at either Bob or Kim, and also uh, Robert S. as well. So. probably talk even louder than Bob does, so I'll move that away a little bit. Um, I'm Kim Spring. I work here in Grand Rapids for Clean Water Action and Clean Water Fund, and a lot of what we do has to do with protecting public health and protecting our, our water and our Great Lakes. But part of what we do also is, in our mission statement, is empowerment to make democracy work. And so last fall, we coordinated 30 plus organizations in Grand Rapids to pull together a massive, what we call get out the vote effort in the inner city lowest income neighborhoods in Grand Rapids. And this was the first time, um, as far as we're aware, that there was a large contingency of African American and Hispanic organizations coordinating to do a large effort. Um, and it was really a fantastic experience and a great day. And we got more people out to vote in terms of voter turnout in those specific precincts than the whole rest of the city. So it was a very successful effort. And um, I wanted to talk about kind of the problems that we experienced just very, very briefly. Um, we had a part of our um, plan was to do what is referred to nationally as election protection. And so a huge cadre of over 100 people were trained to be at the polling places and talk with voters and see if they were having any problems. And if so, we had a standardized format to document those situations and those problems that, that voters experienced. And so what we did is after we went through all that information, a wonderful ACLU lawyer here locally compiled all those reports and a committee put together a document with recommendations to the city clerk to solve some of these problems. And we, since then, a very small group of people have met with the city clerk and the mayor to address these concerns and see what the city clerk could come up with um, to solve some of these problems. And it hasn't gone that well. Um, there are certain issues that are very critical to what we feel needs to be addressed that the city clerk and her staff simply don't agree with, and certain things that she did agree with and, and has indicated that she will be making some changes. Um, our next meeting is at the end of the month on November 30th where she's actually going to report back to this group what changes she has already instituted. And so we'll have a better handle after that meeting on what potential areas we could work on if people wish to get active on this issue and make some changes here locally. Um, this is basically, in my view, a civil rights issue. The fact that we have huge numbers of people in the lower income, high minority neighborhoods assigned to one polling place versus in a 
more wealthy area of Grand Rapids and more white, that they have less number of registered voters assigned to their polling places, automatically sets up a situation where people are going to have to stand in line longer unless there's something instituted to help those specific polling places. And from all indications, the city clerk is not willing to do anything different at any polling place. So for example, if there's 2,100 people registered to vote that vote at Alexander Elementary, which was a huge um, problem polling place last fall, then why don't they have a proportionate number of poll workers assigned to that polling place versus the place where I used to vote in a white neighborhood in a Catholic church, and there's only 700 voters that go to that polling place to vote. There should be less people working in that polling place and more people assigned to the polling places that have higher numbers of registered voters. Um, I'm going to introduce Robert S. here in a minute to talk about some of the specific problems. Robert S. is a very well-known talk show host and, and program director at a local AM radio station, 1140 Jams. And he dedicated four hours a day, five days a week for an entire month, up until and including election day, to talk about why it's important to vote. And this year our voice is going to get heard and just jazzed a huge number of people in the community and got them out to vote and then ended up going to Alexander Elementary to witness what was going on there and talk with people and try and keep them you know, waiting in long lines and whatnot. So I'm going to have him come up and talk about that. But I just want to encourage everyone today, um, we're going to ask you to fill out a, just a three-question survey. But if you have any interest in working on local reform efforts, um, I am not an expert on any of these machines. I'm not an expert on the state of Michigan election law. I know certain things, but I'll be willing to answer questions um, after Robert S. is done sharing a, a personal experience. Um, but what I really want to urge people to do is that we can make some changes here in Grand Rapids. And I feel very strongly that we have um, a strong mayor and strong city commission that will um, assist to get whatever we need to get done here if we come across um, some apprehension on the, the part of the city clerk's office. And so if, when you're filling out your survey, if you want to join that effort or just keep in the loop, or if you're interested in working in 2006 on another similar get the vote out effort, please indicate that on your survey and we will keep you informed. Robert S. Hello, I'd like to thank Kim for being so strong through all of this election garbage that I've been seeing in Grand Rapids. Kim um, actually had some funds to help pay some people that got out there to help get the vote out. And there were a lot of volunteers, way more volunteers that wanted to get out there and didn't even would turn down money. They just wanted to get out and help get the vote out because we knew this was an important election. Our country was at war with no sign of how to get out the war. People wanted to know, people who voted for the current administration voted because they believed that they knew what they were doing. Other people were voting because they thought they could bring in an administration that could change things and knew what they were th doing. So this was an election that wasn't hard to sell people to get out to vote, but uh, we did dedicate 30 days on our radio station to getting the vote out. I mean, all of our contests, if there was a play you wanted to go to see, you had to be a registered voter. If there was a basketball game coming into town, the Pistons during the fall, you had to be a registered voter to win. And uh, we did everything to get the vote out. And one of the shocking, hurtful things that happened was to see all of the people at Alexander School and I've often said this, that when I saw the Superdome in New Orleans and you saw those people standing there, you're like, we never thought we'd see Americans just standing in disarray. To me, I had already saw that nowhere near, because nowhere near the tragedy of New Orleans, nowhere near that. But the vision of people sitting in Alexander School was kind of similar to have almost a thousand people, at least hundreds, the gymnasium isn't even half the size of this room here. And can you imagine 500 people cramped inside of there? Uh, we got to thank Yester Dogs because they sent down hot dogs and soda. And do you know the election people there were getting mad saying that's illegal? 
You can't bring, you know, water to an election poll. But no one said it was illegal not to have enough people to register these people and get those votes through there. Um, and I want to give a shout out to all of the ladies that were working there and men that were working there because a lot of our elderly citizens in Grand Rapids definitely know how important it is to vote. And they've been out there working hard to get to um, process the votes. But they were they did not have an adequate faculty to process thousands of votes at Alexander School. And after it happened, what makes it even worse? You know, at first, I didn't blame the city of Grand Rapids because I'm like, maybe they didn't know this many people would come out to vote. But what hurts is after they saw those people um, who were sitting in line, first time voters, a lot of them first time voters who, who, you know, were scared to vote. I mean, getting people to vote sometimes, some people are more scared to vote than to go to the dentist's office. And here a first time voter comes out and he's in line five and six hours, nine hours, 10 hours. The election results are coming across the TV and you're still there at 1130 and 1230 at night, one in the morning, waiting to vote. And after this, Grand Rapids has done nothing um, to change how it's going to be the next time at Alexander. They haven't advertised anything that's. Um, making us feel we're going to be treated any better. So a lot of people may be afraid to go out and vote. And I just think that um, the people in Grand Rapids need to really get on the city clerk. One thing I can give in favor of the city clerk that she is has made a few calls. I don't know if she's followed up on those that she's going to do some changes, but she has not announced those changes. But I know the city clerk, uh, Terry Haggerty, is concerned because um, I'm on a board that she's on and she did bring up some of her concerns about changing some things. But I don't know if the people in her office actually know because they haven't been in the field how bad it really was. And from watching the media, uh, they tried to portray it, but I don't think they could really tell you how bad it is. I don't think I could, but I think if you care about the political process being fair, definitely watch what's going on in Grand Rapids. Email your officials and let them know you want a fair election because it looks like across the United States of America, we don't really have a checks and balance on what we're going to do to keep a fair election. In Florida, when people didn't get a chance to vote or their votes were thrown out. There were a lot of people went to the Senate floor to get senators to bag it up, to get an investigation in this and all of that, and no senators stood up. So where is the checks and balance? I'm sure that when America was built as a country, checks and balance was a part of all the policies that made this a beautiful democracy, a country that we all could love. And I think they need some new checks and balance with voting. And I just came to share that with you. Thank you. One more thing I forgot to mention, because we didn't go into a lot of details. The 22 or whatever page report that we gave to the city clerk in terms of problems that we documented and recommendations um, to solve those problems is available online. Um, and there's a little sheet of paper you can grab on your way out if you want to get the exact way to, to access that online through um, GRID's website. So I just wanted to highlight that. Just a quickie question because Bob, he did bring a DVD that had some information uh, about what actually happened and we were going to show a clip of it, but we wanted, I wanted to ask folks first, would people rather continue the Q&A at this point or do they want to, to see the, the, the stuff he has in terms of what actually happened some visuals of what happened that day. How, how many people would want to continue Q&A? It was just a show of hands here. Just a few. How many people were more inclined to see the DVD? Mm, <laughs> boy, it's about half and half, maybe a little bit more for the DVD. Um, Bob, which would you rather do? Uh, we, can, we can do the Q&A as long as we get some, uh, maybe do this for another 15 and then show the, at least some of the clips. Which OK. Very there was a couple of questions. And no hands here up here. We'll go this way. Uh, this is a question for, for Bob. I understand, Bob, that the uh, current Democratic uh, mayor of the city of Columbus is running against Bob Taft. The uh, question is, one, does he have a chance? And two, if he wins, do you see any substantive changes? 
Uh, the, actually, the mayor is a friend of mine. Uh, I've known him before he was in uh, politics. He, he's an attorney, as uh, I am. Uh, he works for a, uh, uh, one of the largest uh, building companies in America. Uh, he worked for uh, Schottenstein, Zox, and Dunn, which owns uh, MI Homes. Uh, he's a DLC member. Uh, he does believe in the right to vote, so uh, on that level, there'll be some changes. He's running against Ted Strickland. Uh, U.S. congressman who uh, is probably a more progressive. Uh, I think you'll see cleaner government is that uh, Michael Coleman, if he's elected as the first African-American mayor. Uh, uh, you won't see the corruption, which really was put in place by uh, George Voinovich, who uh, I've, written, uh, I've written a book also called The Brothers Voinovich, uh, which was part of my investigative reporting when I worked for the Columbus Alive. Uh, and uh, the governor's brother actually had uh, well-known ties to the mob, uh, and they did a lot of building of jails and prisons in the state, and luckily the people that built them was the Voinovich family business, uh, the Voinovich company, and people complained so much they changed it to the V company. Uh, so yeah, I think things will be better. Um, Michael Coleman seems to be self-destructing somewhat at this pro time. Uh, both his campaign manager and his wife were recently picked up for DUIs. So uh, he's not going very well, but uh, I think virtually anyone who's real strong could in fact uh, uh, beat uh, uh, the candidates on the Republican side. Although I should tell you who the front runner is for the, uh, for the uh, Republicans, that's J. Kenneth Blackwell. <laughs> yeah, uh, I have a couple of comments and then a question. Uh, the comments are that I heard also that at Kenyon College, where they have 1,300 students, they had only two voting machines and one of them didn't work. Uh, another thing is uh, Bev Harris and Howard Dean, was showing Howard Dean on television in September of last year how to steal, how you could get into the voting machines and in 90 seconds you could change the, the results of that. So I never understood why nothing was ever done about that, but um, Anyway, then, then I heard that there's a new, I heard that the, that the Diebold company is working on a new machine which will use thermal paper, which is heat sensitive and light sensitive and so it sort of disintegrates and then a lot of other things about that, that were corrupt. Um, so I was wondering where that's going or whether that's reached a dead end yet. And uh, then there's, there's the bill, the house, the bill in the House of Representatives 551, and I've heard that that's the gold standard of, of voter, um, you know, for verified voting. And I wonder what you thought about that. But here's my question. <laughs> the question is, uh, what do you say to people who say to you, well, there's always been a lot of election fraud, so just forget it. They've always, it's always been that way. Uh, uh, first of all, uh, students did wait at Kenyon College uh, up to 14 hours. Uh, we had to get temporary restraining orders in Franklin County and in Knox County, uh, where students, uh, you're right, uh, there are 1,300 students, there are two voting machines, one broke. Uh, you need about one machine per 100 uh, voters, uh, and they did finish voting at 4 a.m. Uh, luckily, uh, a mile away at the right-wing Nazarene College, there were no lines uh, and plenty of voting machines. Uh, and Knox County is controlled by a Republican election board. So all that is true. Uh, and again, the question of the machines, where we're going, uh, like the thermo paper, which is similar to the paper you get on an ATM, uh, you can't really recount with it. Uh, there was a man who, uh, Ethan Gibbs, who uh, really convinced me that uh, the technology already exists uh, to provide more safeguards. Uh, and you're not going to get a safeguard with uh, thermo paper printed out after the fact with no way of an individual voter being able to push and see their vote recorded. Uh, what was programmed, programmed in will be programmed out, right? It's garbage in, garbage out. We all know those, uh, all know that, we who uh, deal with computers. So, uh, you know, it's, it's, they'll say they have a receipt. That's a way for them to say there's a receipt. It's not really receipt. Uh, if I said this way, like you go to the ATM machine and you don't get a receipt with it, 
But if you complain after the fact, I'll print out all that thermo paper of everyone uh, that voted that day and show that, you know, you didn't really lose any money. Uh, right? When we go to the ATM machine, we actually expect a receipt for our transaction, not a massive, uh, you know, amount of paper coming out at the end. Also, the question of whether you can look at that stuff, you know, without a magnifying glass. Uh, what you need and what Ethan Gibbs developed, again, is a ballot that comes down under the plexiglass. Uh, I think another thing we ought to uh, be concerned with is that uh, we don't have any federal right to vote, we, nor do we have a constitutional right to vote. And this is what Jesse Jackson Jr. has been writing about and speaking about. And this was clear in, uh, in of course, the Bush v. Gore decision uh, when Scalia came right out and said it and said, look, they don't have to assign electoral votes based on votes. Uh, there is no right to vote in the Constitution. So part of what we need is, of course, uniform federal standards. And in part, I think uh, that has to happen at the grassroots level. Uh, and, and there is 20 or 30 bills. I've, last time I looked, there was 22. But there's a whole lot of things we need. Number one is we all should be voting on the same machines. Number two, the machines should be run by nonpartisan public officials, highly skilled, and we should treat them like slot machines and gasoline machines. They should be massively regulated, ripped apart. Uh, the assumption is, is that somebody's going to cheat with them. Uh, you, know, if we, you know, these uh, slot machines, they get tore down all the time. They have commissions that do stuff. Uh, they make sure people aren't cheating. I mean, with these uh, voting machines, we just bless them uh, send them out. Nobody knows what's going on, and when the weird results come out, uh, we're told that everything's okay. We don't know everything's okay, and the General Accounting Office says they're all hackable. Why would you create hackable machines, particularly those? We also know in Ohio they have back doors. Selected Service, the IRS, the state uh, troopers all can access those machines. There shouldn't be any back doors on, uh, into those machines, into the central tabulators. Uh, makes no sense. Um, just, just a couple of things. Um, there was the programmer from Diebold who testified, I understand, that he had programmed those machines. Wondering if that ever made enough news to um, cause any impact, and maybe how our leaders in Congress um, Percentage-wise, people who are talking about this or trying to do something about it, and then I have a question for Kim after this. You're talking about Clint Curtis. He wasn't working for Debolt, but he was working for um, U.S. Representative Feeney had a computer company uh, from Florida, and Clint Curtis came out and said that uh, this U.S. Representative had him develop a computer program. Uh, that prearranged election results, uh, you know, 51, 49, and also sort of ate the code like many prototypes do to make sure that nobody stole it. And he said, yeah, I did that. Uh, I thought I was working on it to prove how easy the vote could be hacked by the Democrats. He says he now believes he made that program uh, to, in fact, steal elections. And he is accused, and he's also taken a lie detector test, and he's sworn under oath. And a private investigator that was looking into these charges, of course, died suddenly uh, during that process. So, uh, you know, it's, Clint Curtis continues to tell this story. Uh, the General Accounting uh, and General Accountability Office continues to come out front and say, yes, all this is easily done. And on the other hand, most people are simply told it would never happen here. But they're being told by the same people who are most likely to do it. Here's the axiom. There's not much money really in selling election machines. Ken Blackwell personally nego negotiated the deal for Debolt and his primary opponent, Jim Petro, immediately ran to es and s and tried to get the other counties to buy those machines because uh, he doesn't trust Debolt and Blackwell any more uh, than I do. Uh, but there's not much money really in selling voting machines, but there's a lot of money in selling election results. Thank you. And then, Kim, could you just tell us what Terry Hagerty did not want to do regarding your report and, and what you were hoping that they could do? Yeah, a couple of, of things that were cause for concern. Um, there, in some polling places, have been the same poll workers for years or even decades. And 
rather than figure out if those people are doing a good job and they're trained to the to the ability they need to be trained to, there seems to be sort of this territorialism that those people are going to stay in those polling places no matter what. Um, so we then started talking about, oh, well, maybe we can work with that and maybe there can be some sort of competency testing, especially since they're, they're having to retest poll workers because they now allow challengers to be at the polling places and additionally because they switched machines over to the OptiScan. So we were hoping that there could be some sort of way, not that would be embarrassing to people, but to find out if they really did comprehend the information and understand the operations and what needs to happen at the polling place. We met a lot of resistance with that suggestion also. Um, and then she's, she is actually relying on some misinformation. Some of it came from a survey that someone was paid to do regarding handicapped accessibility at all the 88 polling places. And we literally were practically having an argument because I knew for a fact because I was physically at some polling places that were not handicapped accessible and she's saying that they were. Um, so that's another thing I have a high level of concern about, that if you have to walk up three stairs to get to a polling place, I, really that is not handicapped accessible. Um, and there was also some discrepancy in the information that was provided to her by I don't know whom regarding bilingual poll workers. So for example, she stated specifically that there were bilingual poll workers at Hall Elementary. Well, that was one of the polling places that if there was a problem, I got the, the first phone call and then I'd figure out what we needed to do to, to help solve that problem. And there were absolutely no bilingual poll workers and that was one of the problems is that we were providing volunteers that would translate for people and those volunteers kept getting harassed and threatened to be kicked out of the polling place. Um, so that's just a couple of things, Anne-Marie, but there, there are a number of other things as well. And maybe some things have, have been addressed that I'm not aware of since the last meeting that we held, and that's why it's an important before we look at organizing um, a citizen action group that we get through this next phase, which is this meeting on November 30th, and then we can group, you know, get together in, in December and figure out what needs to get done and, and what things we, we feel as a group we want to address. Hi, my, my husband and I are from New York State and New York State is the last state to decide on voting machines that will comply with federal regulations. Uh, our State Board of Election appears to be very resistant to, uh, we're basically given our choices at this moment. We're lobbying for the optical scan system because we think it is generally more reliable and less subject to hacking and problems then the touchscreen machines, our State Board of Elections has consistently been biased in the direction of the touchscreen machines. I wonder if you could comment on the difference between the two. I mean, our state now has legislation requiring a paper trail, and so people who see that there is this legislation think, well, everything is solved. Uh, we don't think that's the case. We know there are potential problems also with the optical scan machines, but we think it will be more manageable. Just briefly, uh, if I had a choice between the Opti scans and the e-voting machines, I would go with the Opti scans. Uh, my understanding, because I've been talking to people in New York, uh, part of what's going on is a uh, uh, D-Bolt in particular is demanding to keep a whole variety of things uh, under trade secrets, uh, and uh, there's a big debate as to uh, what uh, they have to reveal. And we've, uh, and Bev Harris has done a good job with black box voting. We found certain counties in the U.S., the one county in California, uh, that actually allowed the company uh, to have real-time access to all the voting to fix problems. Uh, I guess the, I mean, the OptiScan machines have a couple problems. Most of the problem deals with, uh, number one, the memory cards uh, that uh, in uh, Toledo, uh, we found that two of the eight precincts they were recounting, the memory cards had either been replaced uh, or zeroed out or were brand new or had been erased. We're still not sure. Uh, so it, there's a whole chain of custody questions to protect memory cards. The second obvious problem is, is the calibration problem, is that uh, those things are usually calibrated by a marker. Uh, so you can calibrate them in a way that uh, 
they read very sensitive or not very sensitive, that if someone makes an X instead of uh, colors in a dot, that it won't read. And, or you can, in fact, calibrate them uh, so sensitive that the machine will reject them. That's what we found in Toledo, that there needs to be a clear standardization in terms of marking uh, that is agreed upon because what was happening, people were voting four and five times in Toledo because the machine kept rejecting it uh, because it was either too dark or too light depending upon the poll. The third problem is to make sure that there's a plentiful amount of actual OptiScan markers, that people don't bring in other markers. It's just like the old Scantron, you need the number two pencils. And what we're finding is that uh, there was a whole lot of those that were uh, you know, close to 93,000 punch cards in Cleveland, but really OptiScan, at least 7,000 in, uh, in Toledo that have never been counted this day. The good news is that you can actually go back and look at them, right? They're better than hanging chads. You could, in fact, this day, look at that card and probably see clearly what the intent of the voter uh, was. You can't do that with the voting machines. I vote from here in Grand Rapids, and we had new machines this time from what we've had in the past. I asked who made the machines, nobody could tell me, and I'm wondering, are these new machines consistent all over the city, all over the county? I mean, this was back to grade school, fill in the dot type thing, which I was really surprised about. It seemed like it was going back in technology. What's going on as far as the machines? Who's making them? How foolproof are they? I can only address one part of your, of your question, and that is um, Grand Rapids has switched over to these new OptiScan machines. Eventually, by uh, the 2006 election, all of Kent County will be using the, exactly the same machines. I don't know exactly which communities are still, you know, haven't switched over yet, and I don't know who makes those machines. new machine. Why would they give us a new machine and then give us a new machine? You know, this well, isn't making sense. Uh, I know there's certain counties we've seen that have changed machines two, three times. The other problem when uh, we're looking at these uh, OptiScan machines again is who services them and whether or not you're getting an initial vote at the actual precinct level. Uh, is some counties we found have created central tabulators and feed to the uh, county board of election, you're gonna wanna make sure that if you're using these OptiScan machines that a preliminary and accurate count is done and posted uh, at the precinct level. Uh, Paul Hackett would probably be in Congress today, uh, but uh, they use punch cards in Claremont County there with central tabulators. They don't count them at the precinct level. Uh, and this has happened in the past, it happened in 2004. Apparently, uh, moisture gets in the ballots, particularly when, uh, when uh, the Democrats are about to win in that county, and they have to shut down the computer and then hand count it. And usually the hand count shows a tremendous surge uh, for the other candidate. You may recall that any, any vote that left a paper ballot from OptiScan to punch car, Kerry got 54% of the vote on. Now, uh, the rest of the, he came out in the end with 48% of the vote, so you begin to do the math. Why are you getting 54% on things that leave a clear paper ballot, but you're only getting 48% overall? It indicates that the technology itself is dictating uh, some of the parameters. Perhaps 6% of the vote uh, appears to be disappearing on these faith-based e-voting machines. Just going to take a couple more questions. I want to just remind folks before you get out of here to, to please fill out the survey. And just a couple things in terms of the, the taping of this. Um, we are going to obviously run it on the cable access channel, GRTV, but we will make a VHS or a DVD copy available at no charge for anybody who wants one. So if you want one, just signify you want a copy of it when you fill out the survey. Uh, before you go today. And also, we interviewed Bob today for our radio show, so next Friday uh, at 9.30 in the morning on WYC, um, that interview will air, and it'll be archived online uh, from here until whenever our 
systems go down. So, <clears throat> I um, two things. One is, do you have hope that this next election in Ohio is going to be a, affected in terms of its honesty or accuracy as a result of the um, observing that you're doing? And the other part is, I'm just floored at the extent to which the media doesn't cover this. And it makes me paranoid in terms of what goes on. It's a perfect story. I mean, what young investigative reporter wouldn't want to get to the bottom of this? It's very important. And so what's the mechanism? What mechanism is going on that's holding the story down? Quite frankly, I think it is uh, the reluctance of the Democrats themselves to step forward and suggest that irregularities are going on. Uh, there's almost a gentle person's agreement that you don't suggest that there's something wrong with the voting system in the United States. You don't call into question its uh, legitimacy and also a notion that you'll be pulverized by the you know, the right-wing talk machine uh, immediately as, you know, a sore loser or paranoid or uh, crazy. I mean, I can tell you, I've talked to the people that were in on the decision with uh, John Kerry. John Kerry considered a variety of things uh, before allowing, uh, conceding with 155,000 votes not counted uh, in Ohio and, a, and with really strange votes results from uh, particularly the southwest counties of Claremont, Butler, uh, and Warren, and that is, number one, he was thinking about remaining viable. He didn't want to be perceived as being a sore loser. He was worried about uh, what was happening in Fallujah uh, with the attack uh, that uh, was obviously going to start uh, and uh, did, in fact, start right after uh, the election. So all those factors uh, favored into, uh, and the fact that there was no smoking gun. Uh, here's part of the problem is that the local media didn't do a bad job. Uh, Toledo Play did a good job. The dispatch confirmed that there were missing machines. Cincinnati Inquirer reported upon the long line. Even the Cleveland Plain Dealer did good reporting. The problem is, is that uh, all of them concluded for in their area there wasn't enough votes that were lost, 22,000, 7,000, 5,000, to really change the election. Apparently, nobody taught them that they ought to read the other newspapers and actually do a running total, uh, which gets back to, to the point in the back is that, uh, you know, these voting machines are so strange, they can be hacked in 90 seconds because it's nothing more than, uh, you know, they're running windows, uh, and how long does it take you to cut and paste? That's all how long it takes you to move from one column to another. Uh, and, of course, Diebold actually in his gem system keeps two sets of books precinct tabulation doesn't total to the county tabulation. They have a special set of books that run the county only. So the precincts can be perfectly right, but the counties can be off by tens of thousands. And can they do it again in Ohio? Yes, and I think what they just proved in 2005, uh, I think what's going on, and this should be a key point, is they're trying to discredit all the polling, is that uh, the consortium isn't going to do exit polling. Everywhere else in the world, right, uh, they overturned the results of the Ukrainian exit based on Matoski's polls. And uh, apparently he's deadly accurate all over the world except in the U.S. where the universal laws of statistics don't apply. So what is the response to this is to get rid of the exit polls. Now, uh, in Ohio, uh, we have a great polling uh, entity, the Columbus Dispatch. Uh, they're a Republican newspaper, but they're great pollers. They've been written up twice in po uh, political opinion quarterly. Now, they just said, look, issues two and three are passing with 60% of the vote. They lost with like 32% of the vote. Who is going to believe any of their polls? I think a systematic attempt is now being made to destroy and discredit the polls. And this first happened with George Herbert Walker Bush in 1988. The first time they used these e-polling uh, machines, Danaher machines, they were known as Shooptronics. They were made by a man named Ransom Shoop, who had been accused twice and convicted of uh, election tampering in Philadelphia. These machines were rolled out. Bob Dole was winning by eight percentage points in the primary, and the next day, uh, Bush won by nine, a 17-point shift 
Overnight, John Sununu, who was involved in computers and went to the White House with Bush, brought these machines into Manchester. And that's the first time as a political scientist I had ever seen such inaccurate polling. It usually involves the Bush family, former CIA director, or his son, and these electronic uh, voting machines. The Washington Post reported a surprise you know, surge of voters much like those Republican women who snuck in without anyone seeing them. I have one more question here, too, actually a couple. Um, if the Republicans have nothing to hide in Ohio, why couldn't there be a revote, or what would it take to force a revote uh, with something a little more um, accountable? And are we to the point where we need to bring in international observers? and treat ourselves as a third world country because we can't be trusted to do things right and honestly. Well, international observers did come to Ohio. I was in a meeting with them as a former international observer. They were told by Matt Damschroeder, the director in Franklin County, former head of the county's GOP, that under directive in order from J. Kenneth Blackwell, if they came within 100 feet of the polls, uh, across the 100-foot line, they would be arrested. Uh, Cincinnati Inquirer, a major newspaper, ran a headline, Blackwell threatens to arrest international observers. So uh, that's one of the things uh, we're looking there. Uh, Revotes usually are by statute, and in many cases, uh, all you can do, at least under Ohio law, was to either ask for a recount or to challenge, which I did. I was one of the four attorneys that sued the president, and of course, uh, uh, let, me, let me tell you how that works with the new uh, Supreme Court in Ohio, uh, bought by $14 million of uh, illegal funds. Uh, they agreed with the Attorney General of the state. The statute says we had 10 days for discovery, but the Attorney General decided that they didn't have to answer any subpoena for 14 days. So this meant that despite us having 10 days under law to seek discovery, they wouldn't answer anything to the 14th day. Uh, and then uh, they would subject us to discovery. Also, they filed criminal sanctions uh, and against us and wanted to revoke our law licenses for even challenging uh, or attempting to look at the machines. Uh, and uh, we're going to fine us individually hundreds of thousands of dollars. But I made a Freedom of Information Act request and found that they had only worked 39 hours on the case and 21 was trying to sanction us. So uh, when that went public, that pretty much fell away, that uh, they weren't taking it seriously because they knew we weren't even going to be allowed discovery. So uh, yes, they can steal it again. That's what it's set up for. Uh, and unfortunately, we're, we're getting sort of on a time crunch here, and we have a film that's running at 4 o'clock. Um, people can certainly you know, visit with uh, Bob in the lobby, you know, get his materials, talk with him there, keep the discussion going. And please, before you go, make sure you fill out the, the survey that Kim has and some of us will have with clipboards in there. I just want to, you know, say uh, thanks to, to Kim, to Robert S., and, and particularly to Bob Federakis today for, for joining us uh, in Grand Rapids. And hopefully this is just the beginning of ongoing efforts around election voter reform. Robert, you want the last word? a little of his question real shortly uh, something important he said is what is it going to take to change um, and to get revotes and I was just thinking when he asked that question that when you look historically in these cases I'm going to mention I'm not taking a side on what I would have did if I was on the Supreme Court but when you look at uh, Dred Scott case uh, Brown versus the Board of Education when you look at Wade versus Roe, there comes a point where the people in the United States, when um, you get caught up in this bureaucracy and you see the politicians in the deadlock and the Democrats, they try everything that's on paper and it just doesn't seem to work. Uh, you go to the Supreme Court and the Supreme Court gives it to the administration uh, whose father actually put these Supreme Court justices in here. So there comes a point where I would say that it's actually going to take the people who have been turned away, whose votes haven't been counted, to stand as a collective, even if someone could find those 70,000. And they would actually have to bring lawsuits, uh, civil disobedience, 
uh, crying, as they call it, whining now. When you ask for your rights, you're whining. And if you don't like war, you're a traitor. Um, but we're going to have to be adults and stand up to all of those names that we may be caught. But I would think it would also take the public, as he's been saying, the grassroots efforts to truly go to the courts, to truly fight for their right. Because if even one person took their time to vote and their vote isn't counted, then we really have violated their human rights, the human rights that we're across seas killing people to tell them they're going to vote and do it our way. So how could we even have one person and take their right to vote away? And we need to get the information out to these individuals and to America as a whole. If you feel your vote uh, wasn't counted, you need to join in um, things to help out to get this election right, these election rules right. You need to get downtown. You need to go to court. We need some of our lawyers to uh, take this up, just as Wade versus Roe, and I'm not taking side on that case, but these were individuals who felt that their rights uh, were being violated, and they took it to court. And of all of these important court cases I've mentioned, I don't see anything more important than the right to vote. So that's one thing I think would help change it.